Welcome to our midweek service. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to prepare to worship. We want to welcome everybody, not just here, but everybody that's home as well. We're going to get ready to worship. Let's invite the Holy Spirit here. Holy Spirit, you're welcome. We invite you. Have your way. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice and for, for everything that you give to us. God, we thank you for your generosity, for caring for us, for taking care of us. We love you. God, we pray that you'd be blessed by our worship this evening. We pray that you would be lifted up in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together.
In the middle of the storm 
that line. I know it's not much, but if nothing else fit for a king. You know, we've been talking about, um, and we're going to continue with the Lord's Prayer tonight. And the Lord's Prayer opens with our Father in heaven. And I think it's so fitting that it opens with us identifying who we're talking to as the Father. Because while He is the King, He's the Creator, He is the Lord, we get to call Him Dad. And as a dad of a six-year-old little girl, who is, she is a giver. One thing, actually most things, most of the things that my daughter um, gets specifically in her, um, in her character, in her personality, I'd say like 90 plus percent of her is my wife. I am a terrible gift giver. <laughs> Awful at it. My wife is really good. She remembers everybody's birthdays. I had the same best friend from like preschool through high school. Never once could I remember what that kid's birthday was. It's terrible. But my daughter, she loves to give gifts. And she will like, for, for um, Valentine's Day, she'll get a box and put like the most random things in the box like her own stuffed animals and things. She's just jamming this box full of things because she wants to give the best gift ever. But the thing that I love the most and genuinely love it is when she draws me a picture. And some people might not think much of it. It's a six-year-old's drawing. But man, I love it. And part of the reason why I love it is because it's an expression of how she sees the world and it's an expression of her. And so like when we were singing that, that lyric, I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king. Here's the, here's the wonderful part of that line. You might not think it's much. We might not think it's much. But it's exactly what the Father wants. You might, like, you might wish that you could bring gold and frankincense and myrrh, or all of, you might wish that you could bring something so great. You know, I wish that I could play a guitar like Christella. I can't. I tried. I, I really gave it a go. <laughs> But it didn't work. It didn't work. I, there are some things that I wish I could do. But God is just saying, hey, just, just give me your heart. Just give me your heart. A heart that is after me. A heart that is worshiping me. A heart that wants to make me smile. Just give me your heart. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you for being in this place. Thank you for challenging us. Father God, thank you for accepting something as simple as our heart that is for you. You have no expectation of anything beyond a heart that is for you. You have no need for, you know, you have no need for us to build cathedrals or you don't need the stained glass. You don't need you don't need excellent musicians, even though we have some here. You don't need them. It's not a requirement for us to be your children. We're so grateful for you, Father, for loving us where we are, for always being for us. Holy Spirit, Thank you for encouraging us in our spirits. Can we get our prayer list up real quick? I'm going to do this while we're here. we got some people we need to be praying for. We need to be, be praying, continue to pray for Ukraine. We're going to continue to pray for Israel. The attacks that have been going on there. 
also, you no, know, I'm not sure if Joy has made it on this list yet, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say her name out loud anyway. Miss Joy Clark. She's not here tonight. But anybody that knows Miss Joy, I don't know if anybody was here this past Sunday, but um, we've begun to pray for Joy. She said we can tell the whole world as long as the whole world will pray. So she's um, gotten a hard diagnosis of some cancer in her body. So we're praying for Miss Joy. She is a grandma to me. And um, I've been doing ministry for, I've been on staff at Freedom for going on almost 20 years. Um, And I've seen a lot of people come and go. And I can't think of a single person that has encouraged me in ministry as much as Miss Joy Clark. Um, so I take this diagnosis personally. Um, praying for her consistently. So we're expecting, we're praying and asking God to move in a miraculous way on her behalf. But there's so many others that are that we continue to pray for and you know, we've seen God move, so we're just going to continue to pray with the same expectation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know everything that's, that's going on on this list. You know, all of the afflictions, all of the sickness, all of the diagnosis. You know, all, you know everything. And while we're thankful for physicians, for medical doctors, for their their knowledge that they've received and throughout their studies and throughout their practice, it all falls short in comparison to the one who created life. So while we're thankful for medicine and treatments, we're thankful. We don't put our hope and our trust solely in medicine or doctors, but God, we put our trust in you, that you are the great physician, and you are the same God today, yesterday, and forever. We believe in you. We trust in you. We pray all these things with expectation. We pray for miraculous types of healings praying in expectation that we will see good things come. Lives will be changed. Cells will rejuvenate. Cancer will be cast out. We thank you, God. We thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you have a seat, go ahead and greet a couple people and then we'll move on. right don't really have any announcements for tonight but I did want to note um, that uh, we can go ahead and prepare our offering the way we do offering here is we've got a couple places you can give on the way out at our two main exits 
Um, but we've got a few ways we can give, giving online. We've got through our app, through Venmo. Um, if, you want, um, if you want a direct link, you can use the QR code that's on the tithing envelopes. Um, go ahead and prepare our gifts now. We'll give on the way out. Um, and we're going to go ahead and jump straight into uh, this message for tonight. We've been talking about the Lord's Prayer. We started out with the intention um, to touch on the Lord's Prayer briefly, teaching some main concepts about the Lord's Prayer, which that quickly went from one week, uh, a one week sermon into now we're in week three of the Lord's Prayer. Um, the reason we decided to stretch this out a bit is I figured it was um, if Jesus took the time to tell us you should do things like this, whatever that thing is that he's saying we should do a specific way, we should pay attention to it. So for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking through um, the Lord's Prayer. Um, here's the thing that we're learning about the Lord's Prayer. When we dive deep and we focus on the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer exposes deep meanings that have the power to change the way we pray, but also change the way we live. The first week we talked about um, our Father reminds us. First of all, we mentioned that Jesus said, "Here, let's go ahead and let's let's go ahead and bring the Lord's Prayer up." Matthew six nine through thirteen. Jesus said, "Pray like pray then like this." Notice Jesus didn't say, "Pray this." Remember, he said, pray like this. It's a simile. Do something like this. He's get, basically, what he's saying is, I'm about to give you a template on how you should pray. Pray like this. He said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So that was basically the first week we got together, talked about how God is our Father and how every father ought to possess two things for his children. First thing he ought to possess is care. The second thing he ought to possess is capability. And then when we look at God as our Father, the I, our Father reminds us that God cares for us on an emotional level. And God is capable to lead us through every challenge that we face in life. And we look at the, uh, the heaven part, our Father in heaven. He's our heavenly Father. Our our Father being heavenly or being divine matters because in this life we face things that are bigger than us. It's true. God gives us things that we can't handle. It's a very misquoted scripture. God, don't worry, brother. God's going God's gonna to give you... He, God's not going to give you anything you can't handle. He absolutely will give you things that you can't handle. Why? Because you're not supposed to handle them by yourself. Because you're supposed to lean on the Heavenly Father. We're going to face things that are bigger than us. We're going to contend with losses that we can't seem to face. We'll carry burdens that are too heavy for us to bear. That's why we have a Heavenly Father. And we pointed to the fact that He said, Our Father in Heaven, hallowed be Your name. What does hallowed mean? We determined hallowed means holy, but it also means different. The reason the name of the Lord is different is because there is no other name that invokes peace, comfort, or, or safety like the name of Jesus. There's no other name that induces strength in a weary soul like the name of the Father. You know, we discern there are a lot of names for God. God goes by a lot of names. Jehovah Jireh, meaning my provider, God, my provider, Jehovah Rapha, God, my healer, Jehovah Elion, the most high God, Jehovah Shalom, God, my peace, Jehovah Nisi, God, my banner, Jehovah Adonai, my master. Here's the privilege of being a child of God. You don't have to know all of those names. As a child of God, we get to call him Father. It's important to know that God can be all of the, those things for you, but it's, in, it's even more important to know that you get to go to, to God as a kid, not just as a servant. 
In Romans 8, 15, the Apostle Paul tells us we get a pass. We're adopted into the family. He says, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Last week, we talked about when we pray, it should be our focus to ask the Holy Spirit to help us bring his will and his kingdom to earth. The Bible isn't basic instructions before leaving earth. That's what some people I've heard it said, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. I believe the Bible is mostly instructions for how we bring heaven to earth. Your kingdom come essentially means let me be an instrument by which righteousness, love, and justice can exist on earth. When we say your will be done, essentially what we're saying is your plans are more important than my plans. And whatever your plans are, God, let me see those plans through. Tonight we are actually going to finish the study on the Lord's Prayer with three closing statements. If we look at the Lord's Prayer categorically, we can say the opening of the Lord's Prayer is all about defining who God is, our Heavenly Father. The second part of the Lord's Prayer is all about identifying our part in God's plan, bringing the kingdom of heaven and God's will to earth. The final part of the Lord's Prayer defines our need for God and our part in getting what we need from Him. We're going to start with, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. It's a simple request. It's a simple request that embodies a deep trust in God as our provider. Acknowledging his role in meeting our every need. It's a reminder that every blessing... Every bit of food that we get, every necessity of life is a direct provision from the hand of God. See, I'm afraid, especially in the United States or believers in the United States, I'm afraid for us because I believe in our abundance. We oftentimes forget that God is our ultimate provider because we feel like we have this hustle culture where if we work hard enough and we do enough and we're smart enough, then we can get More and more. And instead of seeing that God is blessing us, we think we're blessing ourselves. The Bible is filled with verses that talk about the importance of recognizing God as our provider. Philippians 4.19, I'm going to kind of go through these quickly. Philippians 4.19 assures us that God supplies all of our needs. It's a powerful testament to the endless provision of God. It reassures us of God's commitment to care for his children as the heavenly father. In Matthew 7, 11, Jesus further illustrates the father's willingness to give good gifts to those who ask. Jesus isn't only highlighting God's role as our provider, but he's also highlighting his desire to bless us and bless us a lot. It invites us to approach him with confidence and approach, us, approach him with expectancy, trusting that he knows our needs and is more than able to meet them. Then we go back to the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 8.3. We're taught by way of the Israelites that God provides not only for our physical needs, but for our spiritual needs as well. It says, he humbled you, causing you to hunger, And then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God or the mouth of the Lord. Here's the big point in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 8. God's provision encompasses not just our physical needs, but also our spiritual and emotional needs as well. In recognizing God as our provider, we're called to a posture of humility, We're called to a posture of dependence on him. When we pray, give us today our daily bread, we're acknowledging that everything we have is a gift from God. When we acknowledge that God is the ultimate provider, we learn to trust God more deeply. We learn to trust in his provision, in his care. 
We rest in the assurance that the one who feeds the birds of the air and clothes the lilies of the field will surely meet our needs according to his riches, not our circumstances. Give us today our daily bread. Second part we're going to look at tonight is forgive us as we forgive. The whole statement is forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. You know, it's a fairly simple statement. It's easy. It's a simple, simple, not easy statement. It's a statement that requests It's a, sorry, it's a a simple statement. It's a profound request that summarizes a divine principle that is central to our walk with God, something that a lot of us aren't very good at. The concept of forgiveness is part of the foundation of Christianity, and it serves as a cornerstone for our faith and even for our relationships. Ephesians 4.32 urges us to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as as Christ God forgave you. It's a commandment for us to forgive, but also reminds us of the basis of our forgiveness. The unfathomable mercy God has shown us through Jesus Christ. It's a call to mirror God's forgiveness in our lives, reflecting His grace and His mercy through us. In Colossians 3.13, it further elaborates the theme. Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have, has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. I love how Paul says, bear with each other here. It's a great illustration. Bear with them. That means carry a burden. It means be patient. Be patient. It means be tolerant of them for a little bit. I hate the word tolerance because of the way our society has kind of like warped it. But there are certain things that we should be willing to tolerate. We shouldn't tolerate everything, but there are certain things that we ought to tolerate. And if we're going to forgive people, sometimes the precursor to forgiveness is showing patience and showing tolerance for people that we just don't really like. Then he says, forgive as, as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. It shows the importance of forgiving others as a reflection of our own forgiveness by God. It's a reminder that our ability to forgive is not, it's not rooted in It's not natural. It's not rooted in our our humanity. Forgiveness isn't natural. It's a supernatural work that happens within us because of the Holy Spirit. And I say it's supernatural because forgiveness isn't natural. We have to teach forgiveness. And I'm afraid as parents, we teach our kids sorry fairly well sometimes. But a lot of times we gloss over forgiveness. It's like this: a kid does something wrong, and you say, "Go tell your brother." You said, "Go tell your brother sorry." <laughs> sorry. Okay, go play. But nobody really understands apologizing. Nobody really understands. Gaining forgiveness or even giving forgiveness. There are two parts to an apology. This works great in marriage as well. If you're married or want to be married sometime, take a note. There are two parts to an apology. And I'll tell you why you need to know this. Because you, whether you're the man or the woman, you're going to screw up. You're going to say something you wish you hadn't said or not say something you should have said. You're going to not do something that you should have done or do something you shouldn't have done. Get good at apologizing and don't gloss over it. Don't just say it just to make it look good. Two parts to an apology. There's two parts. One is the I'm sorry. Not like the five-year-old little kid that just knocked his sister's Legos down. I'm sorry. Really what that translates to is I don't want to get my butt whooped. I'm not really sorry. They just 
don't want to get punished. I'm sorry. I feel bad. That's what I'm sorry is supposed to be. It's a translation to I actually feel sorrowful for what I did, for what I said. First part to an apology, I'm sorry. The second part to the, the apology is, will you please forgive me? It's a call to action. Can you forgive me? Because until you get the yes or the no, you can't move forward. Will you forgive me? There's two parts to forgiveness as well. I know we've all heard, forgive and forget. Well, that's impossible. It just is. I'm sorry, guys. It's impossible. You can't forgive and forget. You know why we can't forgive and forget? Because we have brains and memories. You can forgive, but the forget part is really pretty impossible. You will always remember, which is why the forgiving is sometimes really difficult. Because you remember what the person did to you. So instead of forgive and forget, this is what I, I teach. Remember, first part, know what they did. Fully grasp it. Fully grasp what they did to you. Second part is release it. Release them from guilt. They're not guilty anymore. Remember and release. Don't forgive and forget. Remember and release them. In a relationship, somebody does something or says something that they shouldn't have said. They come to you. They apologize. Really apologize. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I feel bad for what I did. Will you forgive me? I will remember it, but I will release you from guilt. When you say you're forgiven, that's what it means. That means you don't get to bring it up again. In Matthew 18, we find the parable of the un unmerciful Servant, which illustrates the consequences of failing to forgive. Leading up to the parable, Peter asks a question about how often, <laughs> how often um, we, should, we should forgive, which leads Jesus to tell this story about a servant whose master forgives a massive debt. That same servant then has the audacity to refuse to forgive a minor debt that's owed to him. The parable ends with a sobering warning about the heart of forgiveness, underscoring that our forgiveness from God is contingent upon our willingness to forgive. And this kind of feels weird because we're saved by grace, not by works. And this feels like I'm only going to be forgiven if I do something, but that's not the point. This doesn't mean our salvation is dependent on works. But that our ability to forgive exposes what is actually going on in our hearts. When we actually understand what it means for Jesus to release us from the guilt and the shame that is associated with the sin and the immorality that's in our lives, when we actually grasp the depth of that, how can we hold other people, no matter what it is, how can we hold other people to their sin? When we reflect on the words, forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors, we have to embrace the full weight of, of those words' meanings. A statement isn't just a request for God's forgiveness. It's a commitment to live out forgiveness, the kind of forgiveness that we've been granted. When we pray, give us today our daily bread, we're acknowledging that everything we have is a gift from above. When we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, we're not only aligning our hearts with God's, but we're also cultivating a life that's marked by grace, by peace, and reconciliation, which is God's plan for our lives. This third and final part is lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's an, this statement is a humble acknowledgement of our vulnerability to sin. We're all vulnerable. We all have the ability. What's wild, do you think of like a guy like King David? He was a shepherd, raised, he killed Goliath, became a warrior. Right? And then he thought too highly of himself. 
stepped out of his purpose, ended up on a rooftop, ends up an adulterer and a murderer. We all have the ability to fall into sin. Deliver us from evil. Is this, it's a testament to our reliance on God's strength and guidance from the Holy Spirit. In James 1, 13 and 14, we're reminded of, the, reminded of the nature of temptation and our responsibility when we're facing it. James, who was Jesus' brother, can't imagine that. But <laughs> he said, let no one say when he, he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. What do we learn here? One, temptation is not from God. Two, temptation arises from within us. We all have a natural affinity to sin. We all have a natural affinity to immorality. Some of us have a natural affinity to run to alcohol and let alcohol control us. Some of us have a natural affinity to tear people down through gossip because we were torn down and we're pretty insecure about ourselves and it feels better when we rip other people down. Some of us have a natural affinity to all kinds of sexual perversion. What James is saying is, we have a responsibility to navigate our desires and make choices that lead us down paths of righteousness. No matter what your sin is, take control of it. Take responsibility for it. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it offers a reassurance and hope that when we face temptation, that we will not be overtaken. It says, no temptation is over has overtaken you. That is not common to man. That means nobody is going through something that somebody else hasn't already been through. Nobody's being tempted by something that somebody hasn't already survived. There is no temptation that isn't common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, this is actually a scripture where everybody gets messed up. God won't give you anything you can't bear. That's not what the scripture means. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. In James, we find we have desires that we have to contend with. But there's also really good news. God is not going to abandon us in our sin. 1 Corinthians 10.13 is a promise that with God's help, we can overcome any, any temptation, no matter how impossible it might feel. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3 goes a step further, strengthening our confidence in God's protection. It says, but the Lord is faithful. There we go again. He's faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. There's three things I want to note here. First, it says the Lord is faithful. Like it said, it, it said it in uh, 1 Corinthians as well. What does that mean? He's, it means he's not going to give up on you. It means he's not going to abandon you. It means his yes, his yes means yes, his no means no. The second part I want to pull out of this uh, scripture, 2 Thessalonians, is the Lord will establish you. It's kind of a weird word to use here. He will establish you. The original text is translated to mean God will put you in position. See, some of us think we're in the position we're in because God's forgotten us. We feel like God has abandoned us. The truth is some of us are in the position we're in because we made bad choices. God didn't abandon you, you abandoned him. Some of us call things spiritual attacks when really it's just consequences. It's not a spiritual attack. It's a consequence. Still, there's a third option. 
Some of us think the Lord has forgotten us or abandoned us when the truth is he hasn't. It might feel like you've been abandoned, but the truth is, is if you are pursuing him, you're pursuing righteousness, if you're following the will of God and you're, if you're trying to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, if you're doing all of these things and things don't seem to be adding up, the truth is God might be positioning you. Just because it feels bad, it doesn't mean it is bad. The Lord is faithful. He's going to establish you. The third part of this scripture is the Lord will guard you. This means the Lord. What does it mean to be guarded? It means he's on watch. It means his head is on a swivel. It means he's looking around. See, I know a thing or two about guarding people. I've guarded a handful of people in the last few years. I'll tell you, the easiest people to guard are the people who have experienced real violence. Real violence. The easiest people to guard are the ones that know the benefit of listening to the person who is responsible for their safety. This isn't like a well-known side of, side of my life, but um, outside of the church, I have a security company. We, we, um, we specialize in private investigation and executive protection, which is a fancy term for what most people think of like bodyguarding. And over the last few years, I've had the opportunity to guard some people. Some are like musicians, but I've also guarded like um, some political figures or um, military figures. I'll tell you, the, the hardest ones to guard are the celebrities. Because <laughs> they have no idea that bad things could happen to them. And they are just there for the fans. They're there to get their pictures taken. They're there to get, shake everybody's hands, and they just love the attention. And the easiest ones are the ones that have really seen some stuff. And when you say... Hey, sir, I believe it's time for us to move. There's some activity in this area that's making me feel uncomfortable. I think it's time for us to move to another location. And they say, yes, sir, and they go. See, some of us are in the position we're in because the Lord is on guard, and he's warning us of dangers, but we're just taking in all the sights. We're just shaking hands and getting our pictures taken. We really like the affirmation. We're ignoring the voice of the good shepherd. He's saying, hey, there's a lion over there. Hey, you might not want to go over there. There's some danger. We're just overtly refusing to pay attention to the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. But the Lord is there to guard you. You know, as we meditate on the petition that is spelled out in Matthew 6, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We have to remember that it's a call for us to be vigilant. It's a call for us to also depend on God as our protector. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Invites us to actively seek God's guidance through prayer and the study of his word. It's an invitation to rely on his strength in the middle of our weakness. It's an invitation for us to look for the escape from the temptation that the Holy Spirit provides for us. I'm getting ready to close. Here's the big challenge I have for us all. Can you go ahead and spread those out for me? We may even pass them out in a minute. But here's the big challenge. To embrace this prayer not just as a request, but to embrace it as a declaration for of our faith in the one who guides us, one who protects us and leads us in paths of righteousness. I want to grab one of these. Yes, I grabbed one that's kind of messed up. So you guys don't get this one. That was perfect. So I, I created um, some cards, Lord's Prayer. I'm going to invite everybody to get one. And put it, you can use it as a Bible bookmark or throw it on a magnet.
put it on your fridge just as a reminder. Put it somewhere where you're going to see it. Tape it to your mirror. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to, in just a second, we're going to have everybody just close their eyes, bow their heads, and we're going to pray through the Lord's Prayer together. I'm going to say what Jesus said, but then I'm going to give you a few moments to focus on, to think on how that it impacts you, how it applies to you. So I'll read the line. I'm going to read basically what we've discovered through this study. I'm going to wait a few moments and let, we're all going to just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us personally. We'll do some prayer time at the end. I'll invite um, some team members to come pray. But before we do that, I'd like to walk through this as like a, that's just a punctuation at the end of this uh, study. Let's all bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Let's pray. Our Father, focus on the fact that God cares for you. He is capable to respond on your behalf. Think about the things that He might be responding to. Think about the ways that God has cared for you. Even invite the Holy Spirit to reveal some things some ways that God has cared for you. Let's sit for a moment. Our Father in heaven. The point here was our Father is supernatural. Nothing is too big for Him. Allow the Holy Spirit to encourage you right now. Whatever is just seems monstrous in your life, you have a Father who is divine. Hallowed be your name. The name of God is different from all other names. There's no other name. No other name like the name of Jesus. Jesus invokes peace and comfort into our lives. His name is different, His name is holy. If your life is in chaos, you may just want to sit here for the next 30 seconds and just speak the name of Jesus over your life because his name is different. Hallowed be your name.
your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, we want to be an instrument by which your righteousness, your love, and your justice can exist on this earth. God, we're committed. No no matter what our plans are, your plans are paramount. Our plans are second at best. Pray these things in your words. Speak these things from your spirit to the spirit of the Father. Give us today our daily bread. God, we acknowledge that you're the one that meets our needs. We are only elevated to where we are because you are in control. You meet our needs. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. God, we are sinful. All all sin, all falls short. And we're included in that. I am included in that. God, forgive me. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And while we're here, Is there anyone I need to forgive? Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you right now. Is there anyone that I need to forgive? Lastly, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God, we know that we are susceptible to sin. We live in a fallen, sinful world that doesn't seem to have much light. But God, we know that you go before us and you prepare prepare ways out. You prepare escapes for us to escape the plans that the enemy has for us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. If there's anybody here that would like some additional prayer, I've got some team members that are going to prepare to pray with, with you. I've got these little cards up here I'd love for people to come and get. Take them home. Use them as a resource, as a tool to remind us how we ought to be praying. Not what, but how we ought to be praying. The things that that we ought to be reciting. The things that we ought to be meditating on and focusing on. As it comes to prayer, put it in a place that you'll see it. I'm going to pray. If anybody would like additional prayer, we've got team members here that are prepared to pray with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word, for this study. Jesus, thank you for spelling this out for us. God, I pray that you would bless each and every one of us. I pray that you would cause happiness and goodness to go before, to meet your kids wherever they're headed to next. From this place to the next, 
wherever they're headed next in life. God, I pray that your goodness, your happiness would follow them like a shadow. God, I pray that we would reflect your love and your light to the entire world. Your love would shine on us and people would come to know you simply because they know us. We love you. We thank you for all these things. Thank you for Jesus. In his, his name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming tonight, guys. We'll see you on Sunday.